Prim Suripapat is with us. Tennis media star, played for Duke, dominated at ESPN, is getting her PhD right now. <laughs> I feel like she's living multiple lives in one. That is how talented she is. I'm Brian Fenley, and I'm on Twitter at Brian Fenley. Prim is on Twitter as well, and I work at Fox Sports Radio. Prim, I, I, first of all, I'm so grateful for your time, knowing how many responsibilities you mm -hmm. have. You've got a little son <laughs> as well, so you've got yeah. so many different things that are going on in your life. And what a world yeah. we're living in in 2020. It's, it's upside down in, in a large part with the upheaval and angst and anxiety out there. But despite all this, Prim, what do you turn to that makes you smile? Uh, I turn to human interaction, which is why I'm here with you, because <laughs> that's one thing that I really miss. Um, and by the way, hats off and credit to you, Brian, for those that don't know, because you and I were communicating at 5 a.m., which is 5 a.m. Eastern time. Yes. And you were just going to bed as I was getting up. And you're like, okay, well, I just got off work. And I'm like, wow, I remember those days. So I don't know how many, how many hours of sleep you got, but um, <laughs> you look very functional. So uh, you seem like you were doing very very well. <laughs> well, if I had a kid, I think that would make my sleep schedule even more truncated. So I can't even imagine yeah. your hours, how you are gunning for your PhD, you're dominating in the media space, <laughs> and you have a kid. Like, how do you find time to make all of these things happen? That's a really good question. It's a balance that I'm still striving to figure out. Some days I feel like I can do it and I feel like shouting out to the top of the world, especially to a lot of women out there and soon to be mothers or current mothers that this is possible, that you can be a mother and a parent and also still continue to have your passions and, um, and have a career. But then there are other times, I'm not going to lie, like yesterday where I had a major breakdown and I'm like, I just don't know if, um, if it's possible, but you just kind of you know, as, as I was speaking to a former alum of my program, she said, whenever you feel like slipping, whenever you feel like quitting, just hold on, just yes. find a way to hold on. And it sounds so simple and it sounds very, maybe cliche, mm -hmm. but it, I just kept it in the back of my head. It's like, you just got to hold on and take it day by day and step by step and, and try to figure out solutions. And, you know, I think it's like, I think the hardest thing to do is extracting ourselves out of this personal or professional storm, whatever storm that we are going through, and just taking a step back and having a macro perspective on things. And it's like, okay, let's just take a deep breath and look at the situation. I'm like, what's the biggest issue right now? Like juggling the demands. Am I putting too much pressure on myself? Um, are my expectations too unrealistic right now? Do I need more me time? Um, and also like, sometimes I'll ask my question, like, is this really what I want to do? And I'll put something else on the table and say like, well, what if I was doing this? Or what if I continue to do what I was doing before? And if the answer is no, I, I, I don't want uh, either one of those things. I want to do this right now. That'll kind of like re-engage me and, and help me settle back into whatever I'm doing. You've so. got so many different projects that you're working on you know it's it's tennis it's sports casting it's going to school it's being a mom it's getting your doctorate all of these things there's that constant chase there's that constant grind we all know what that's like yeah. not at the extreme of what you're doing because what you're doing is just super you know stellar in the fact <laughs> of how you're doing you. this is unbelievable but I find that at times when we are gunning for something that we don't give, and I might not be speaking for you, but certainly speaking for myself, not give us enough credit for where we are in the journey because we're always looking to what it's going to look like totally. when we're done. So like, mm -hmm. how do you allow yourself or when do you allow yourself to give that self-fulfillment a, a little bit? when that emerges so that you can say, yeah, I know that I'm not exactly at the destination, but goodness, I've accomplished a lot in my life. Yeah. I think that's, uh, that's something again, that I'm still balancing. And I'm definitely one of those people that's like, you know, when I was applying to, to, um, doctoral programs and PhD programs, I was like, you know what, if I just need, if I could just get in, I just need to get in somewhere yeah. because I felt like, 
you know, I, I have a, you know, fairly uh, decent academic background, but then I felt like I was coming out of left field and spent 17 years in broadcasting and, and sports. I was like, there's no way some of these schools are going to look at this and compared to like my research experience compared to some of the other candidates, my research experience is zero. And some of these other people have spent 10 years in the mental health industry. Um, but you know, I just, I, I thought to myself, I was like, if I could just get in and I got in, I was like, yes, that's it. I don't have to worry about anything. And then all of a sudden the mind shifted to, okay, if I could just get done, if I could just get through this program, I've just got five years, just get through this. So I do the same thing. And I think it's just, um, you know, it is a, a benefit and advantage, but also a consequence for myself. And I think a lot of people have this where, um, you know, we're, we might be a little type A um, and it's easy to look down the road and, and think about the end goal. But, you know, a lot of my mentors and, and the coaches that I've worked with um, and, and also friends who are very successful, they have always just kind of mentioned, you know, figuring out the little steps and milestones, because those are the things that are really going to give you the baby steps to get you where you want to go. So if you're running a marathon, rather than thinking of the finish line and 26 miles, you might say like, okay, I'm going to work on my pacing for the first couple of miles. And now I'm going to work on my stride. Now I'm going to think about my breathing. Think it, you know, you look at the next tree and you just take it there step by step. And so for me, it's just trying to figure out many milestones. And you're right. There's a lot of things that are kind of um, up in the air right now and a lot of things on my plate, but I, I'm somebody that likes to journal and write okay. things down and write to-do lists. So if you're looking for more actionable items, um, I definitely, I write down things. I have a to-do list every single day. So that's how it gets me through, um, gets me away from thinking too much about that finish line goal, which is sometimes it may or may not be unrealistic. And I think the most important thing, the one thing that I've always learned, and I keep, this, this lesson keeps coming up and I oftentimes forget it, and I think a lot of us do, is that it's not about the end goal or the result or the finish line and, and finishing the race. It's about the process. Like we'll always remember the journey, you know, and I'm sure Brian, you can, you know this in terms of broadcasting. It's, it's a really unbelievable, fulfilling industry, but it does not come without its challenges and obstacles mm -hmm. and really long late nights where you're coming home at, I don't know, 3, 5 a.m. because sure. of the Padres uh, baseball game that went 17 innings. I don't know what it is about the Padres. I have this thing <laughs> against the Padres because I always, in my entire career, it's always been them that have gone like 18 innings and it's like <laughs> 5 a.m. I'm like, I just want to go home. Um, but yeah, I think it's just thinking about those, those little things that will get you where you want to go um, in the long run. The great Prim Sharipapat is with us. I'm Brian Fenley, and your studies in psychology and, and mental health, going do towards why you're so compelled into that field, one of the questions I had for you was, when you help somebody reach a psychological breakthrough, how does that feat or accomplishment compare to anything else that you've ever done in your life? Yeah, you know, right now I will say that I um, I am not a licensed psychologist, so I haven't worked with a ton of patients. I've only really mentored them, but I can tell you from at least from the perspective um, of being a patient and being the person in therapy, um, it's definitely not the amazing. I'm holding up a trophy accomplishment. It's a different kind of experience. I would say most of the time when you experience a massive breakthrough. If you're in the client position and you're sitting in the chair, it's actually quite painful. <laughs> but the pain, but, the, but it's like a good pain where you know you learn to understand that pain means an opportunity for growth. And so it's very similar if you're relating it back to sport, like pain, not necessarily physical pain, but pain may be associated with loss or some sort of defeat or maybe making a glaring mistake. Um, uh, those things are just opportunities to learn. So now from a, I'll just speak from a coaching perspective or mentoring perspective when I'm working with somebody or when I have used some of the things that I do know, at least with my master's level um, degree, I, it's, um, it's just rewarding. I think the thing about athletic accomplishments is like, there's this, just this physical prowess and domination, this like, 
aggressiveness um, that you get from it and you walk off and you're sweaty and tired. It's just like a different feeling. When you're with somebody and you feel like you've made a breakthrough and you've helped uncover and peel back some layers about their lives that have made them not only learn more about themselves, but are putting them on the path towards healing. It's just, I would say it's like one of the best feelings in the world. Like that's the whole purpose of, that's the whole reason why I'm getting into this field is because, you know, there are some things that, um, you know, my, my career in broadcasting, it continues to be really fulfilling, but something was missing there where I was like, I achieved certain things. And I was like, I feel like I'm talking about things and it's not resonating with anybody. Like, is it, is it, is it changing in anybody's lives? And is it changing for the better? And so that I would say that's like the most rewarding thing. And the thing is, is that when you're working with people and I'm sure I'll, I'll obviously learn more as I continue to go through practicum mm -hmm. and go through my training. Um, but it's, you never really know how some of these things are going to hit certain people and how and whether or not you're going to get the result that you want but you know that at least you're there trying to help the person mm -hmm. and you're and you're holding their hand as you pull them through some really difficult conversations and moments some of that means going back to the past and revisiting some painful memories or maybe that's thinking about the future and kind of like reorganizing some things so both are rewarding, um, but it, it's definitely just a different feeling. There's a, there's a softness, there's a compassion to it, um, and just like a fulfilling, rewarding feeling that comes along with that. And I'm sure, Prim, that as you help others through this process, that you, know, you might have yourself dealt with mental health issues. I know mm -hmm. I have, and that also seems to compel us to want to help others because we perhaps were in a state that we were not comfortable in. We don't like to be in that state. We don't like to see anybody else that we know and love in that state, and we want to help them get to where they feel more comfortable with where their life is. And there's still, I feel, Prim, such a stigma to to holding in a lot. You know, yeah. I, I had some trauma in my life. You know, my dad died when I was a kid from cancer. And then I mm. had like anxiety and depression and panic attacks. And it was just, you know, I was mm. nearly hospitalized. And so I was a mess and I don't even know how I got through that. But it's yeah. the work that you're doing that is just priceless because <laughs> I don't know where I'd be without, you know, those who are in your shoes that were there to help me during that time. And thank goodness I had the resources to have that, which is another part of this to get the help. But I, I'm yeah. sure that, that Prim in your own experiences as well, that there were moments where you had to find a way to get through times that were challenging. And maybe that motivated you to get into this field of wanting to help. And then that hopefully makes you feel more fulfilled with your mission in life. Yeah, no, I mean, there's no question. I've always had a passion for psychology. I love people. I was always curious about human behavior and what drove people. I, I majored in sociology um, in undergrad at Duke. And uh, although I went into sports and would spend the next several many years in sports broadcasting, but I always tried to find a way to tie it back to psychology or mental health. Or, um, you know, when I was at ESPN, I launched a podcast called Inside Out, which focused on the mental side of sports, or I, I try to do an NFL countdown piece on the power of mental imagery and visualization with Doug Baldwin, who, who used to be with the Seahawks. So I've always had that passion, but you're right. My personal journey absolutely paved the way for, for me to be where I am right now. Uh, my, my story is probably no mystery. It's been out there um, for those who have read about it, but a lot of it was tied to my athletic identity and my, my life being totally focused on tennis as a child and also um, adolescent and then into college. And once that was taken away from my life, some of it was injury, some of it was just, you know, just falling out of the game and it was time to retire after college. And uh, when I, when tennis left my life, I felt like I had absolutely nothing. And a lot of that had to do with just complete imbalance in my childhood. Sure. So, you know, on the surface, I was fine. I was operating well. And it looked like I was, you know, doing fairly well in television and professionally. But internally, I had, I don't, I, I was not equipped to handle the emotions, nor as athletes, 
or just like people in general, there's not really a discussion. I had never really had a true discussion of like, okay, what's the difference between sad and grief and loss? What is identity? What is your identity as an athlete? What is your identity as a girl? What is your identity as an Asian American, as a brown skinned woman? Like I had never had those conversations. And so, um, you know, for 22 years old, I just didn't know how to handle it. And so I ended up resorting to an eating disorder. And, um, you know, it kind of started around 18 years old. And ironically, in my general psychopathology class, I'll have to pull up my, my yeah. book, but um, in my general psychopathology class, I'm reading about this. And so mm -hmm. it's called the DSM-5, it's a diagnostic Okay. And statistical manual of mental disorders, but it talks about every single disorder that's been um, researched and backed up by numbers and all this other stuff. Yeah. And so in there, I started reading a little bit about myself and my condition and um, with regards to anore anorexia nervosa. Now, I had never been um, diagnosed with it or hospitalized. I think I had more of a mild form of it, sure. but in it, it lists a lot of risk and prognostic factors familial um, factors that might contribute to it, personality, dispositions. I'm totally going off on a tangent. I'm going to bring it back to the question. No, I, I love promise. this. This is great. I'm learning <laughs> so much from you. <laughs> oh, keep it up. But, um, but, you know, my point is, is that I, I'm definitely learning a lot about myself. And, you know, my, my eating disorder was just my way of coping sure. with things. And so, you know, and, and thank you so much for sharing about um, your father's passing. And, you know, that's just a perfect example is like when something traumatic happens, and by the way, trauma happens, comes in all shapes and sizes. It's yeah. not like, it's not just the September 11th attacks. It is loss. It's identity loss. It's the, the a loved one dying. So that comes in all different shapes and sizes. And so when we experience trauma or a significant change, like the question is, is a human being ready and equipped to handle that. Um, so from a logistical perspective, I was fine. I was handling my professional career fine, but emotionally I was not. So I eventually got help at the age of uh, 30 years old because I was like, you know what, I was, I'm, I'm grateful that I was humble enough to say, you know what, whatever you're doing right now isn't cutting it. You, you have to get help. And that's one thing that I think I could, um, I can thank sports for because in sports, if you're not coachable, you're never going to be good. The best athletes in the world are the most coachable because they listen. And not only do they listen, they're able to execute change the moment somebody tells them or the moment they lose and they made a complete mistake, they can change it physically, mentally, emotionally. And so I just made a commitment where, you know, I'd never, I I'd come to think of it. I didn't know any family members or friends who were really going to therapy at the time. Um, it wasn't something that I talked about, maybe mm -hmm. other than like one of my good friends and she had just started going to therapy too. And so maybe that was a huge piece of it. Um, but uh, to wrap things up to your question, but that, that really like sent me towards the path of recognizing how beautifully powerful psychology is. And so this therapist, somebody who I continue to see today over the past decade, Dr. B, She's really transformed my life, um, not only with my health issues, but my relationship with myself. Yeah. Um, she's helped untangle some of the things with my childhood, with my family, intimacy. Um, and she knows nothing about sports. And when I went back to play competitively several years ago, she yeah. even helped my performance, not only as a sportscaster, wow. but also as a tennis player, which is nuts. But that that just goes to show like you don't need to know anything about a skill or area or sports to be able to change somebody's life somebody's life mm -hmm. and so i mean after that and also realizing what i had experienced and that if i had struggled so much with identity loss and retirement with with for my own self um i thought to myself i was like gosh is there are there others out there and so once I started kind of coming up to the surface and healing and re recognizing my journey, this is about four or five years into therapy, I started asking other people that and I realized I wasn't the only one. Wow. And so that's, that allowed me to recognize how many other athletes in particular, just people in general, needed help in some sort of way. And they had experienced such a sim similar struggle. And that's why I'm going back to school um, so I can become 
trained and educated and appropriate appropriately credentialed to to pay it forward and just and help others like my psychologist did with me the pride can be such a downfall for people because they think they know it all they yeah. think they can get through it on their own volition but that's what's holding them back from a breakthrough from inner peace and yeah. like I, I think sometimes you have to hit a really low spot for that to become a wake-up call like goodness yeah. i can't figure this out on my own and for those who like you said can be coachable can say look it's out of my control i need help those mm -hmm. are the kinds that are able to get through this it's those who feel like they're embedded in their ego and they can take care of this so there's always an excuse I really, I, I feel so bad for them because if they only knew yeah. that there is so many people out there that are just a call away from getting the help they need, their lives yeah. could be, could be so changed with all the interviews you've done, Prim, whether it's at ESPN or the athletic, other sports media outlets you've been a part of and continue to work with. What's a conversation that you've had with an interviewee that had such a power on you that it was so life changing in, in one aspect that it oh, was man. incomparable to any other interview you have ever done. Um, gosh, that is so hard because I feel like there are, everybody has such a cool story. And I think that's why I enjoy, I, I enjoy continuing to be in broadcasting because I like interviewing and I like talking to people and finding out about people's stories. So I, I don't know if I have a great answer for you, but I, I guess maybe two, at least recently in this phase of my life, two um, interviews come to mind. The first one was with Doug Baldwin, who used to play with a former wide receiver with the Seattle Seahawks. And he was probably the first like real, more high profile um, interviewee that I had gotten for my show, The Next Chapter. And um, I, I set it up and this was after I had finished my master's degree in counseling psychology. And I really knew that I was pushing forward with my doctoral degree. And like, I, I really had a clear vision of what I was gonna do. And this was my first time also really sitting down with somebody since I had gotten laid off from ESPN. So there were a couple of factors that were coming into play. So this was like with by myself, kind of like with no big name, no big network attached. And this was just all my passion project and like a part of the vision that I have in this project that I believe and I hope will serve me and my family for the rest of our lives. Mm. So I was definitely nervous because I know that Doug doesn't, is not the most, um, open person. He doesn't do a ton of media. And, um, and he was gracious enough to sit down with me. And we sat there for two hours. And, you know, I think, and I think you'll understand this as a broadcaster, like earlier in your career, you're always worried about yourself. You're worried about how you look and how you yeah. sound. And you're always thinking about the next question. And when you think about the next question, you're not really listening to the person. That's a great you're more point. worried about like how you sound and whether your question sounds perfect because you're on camera, all this stuff. And I wanted to strip that away because like a real conversation, you know, is about just being fully engaged and listening to the person. And it's not about you, it's about them. And so that's what I wanted to do when I sat down with him. And he had, he really talked about some really deep personal things. And when I sat down with him for two hours, just everything just like disappeared. It was almost like when you're playing a match or a game and you're in the zone and like, you can't hear anything. It's just like dead air. We were both zoned in and um, we talked about his identity loss. We talked about his childhood, um, some of the depression that he experienced when he left football and why he got into football and he was able to deconstruct like the, maybe the, the false foundation um, that allowed him to continue to be in football and think why he loved it. Um, and also we had a moment where I took his, um, his goodbye tweet, which mm. is like a series of 10 tweets. And I comprised it all together on a piece of paper. And I said, here's your, you know, your goodbye letter to your fans. And I was like, you know, <laughs> and I know it was like very sensitive. So I wanted to be very like, 
maybe this is very unjournalistic of me, but I was like, would it be okay if you, would you like to read it or would you like me to read it? You, you know, he's like, this is your show. You tell me what you want to do. I was like, well, it's very personal. I was like, well, I'd like for you to read it because it's your words and you, you know it and you should have the opportunity to say it. And so he read through it and it was just like, everybody that was there were like brought to tears and brings me wow. to tears because like hearing somebody, that's something, and I, that's something that my therapist does with me. Like anytime I'm saying goodbye to something, whether it's like a, a city or a career or somebody, a relationship, anything, you can write a letter and that's your way of like making peace with it and saying goodbye. Cause that's something that we don't often um, get to do. You get that closure at least. And so we sat there um, and he read, read his letter and we were both in tears. Everybody was in tears afterwards. And I, you know, I asked him, I was like, um, you know, had you ever, had you read that out loud? And he's like, no, and you write things, you think of things, you don't read it out loud, especially when, you know, when you're here with somebody else. And so we were able to reflect on that moment. And I think that interview maybe selfishly speaking, but that interview with Doug was like so special, but it also brought me a sense of confidence about like my, my abilities and my passion and, and the direction in which I'm taking, um, not just my professional career, but also like my personal, my personal passions. And like, I think that's, that's, that's everybody's hope, right? Is that we align our sole purpose and what our passion is with our professional career because those things don't always align, you know? And I think it was just that interview where I was like, you know, this is gonna be hard. I've, I've got a really long road ahead of me. and I have to create this path for myself, but, and also having my husband there to hear it and reflect back to me and get some, some outside um, opinion. That was, that was probably pretty special. And also my interview with Billie Jean King several weeks ago during the US Open. You literally were you. You literally read my mind because that was my next question. <laughs> I was going to bring up Billie Jean oh. King. Oh, I was. Oh yeah. Because how did be you know I interviewed Billie Jean? Well, I what I did is I also saw that you had done a piece on her. What was it like a fifteen-page piece that you yes, wrote yes. on her? So I was going to bring that up, which obviously connects right in with your interview with her. So yeah. you. I would, you know, going back, you, you talked about doing like a 15 page piece on Billie Jean King and, and someone who you said that you obviously deeply respect and yeah. used her platform as a vehicle to promote equality. Let's go to what she means to you, your interview, yeah. and also what led you to write that 15 page piece because I would be fascinated to hear how. If she was coming up in these times, how yeah. different it would be. Yeah. Uh, so I wrote a paper out of necessity because okay. I was I had to write a psychobiography. It was one of my first classes in my doctoral program this past summer, and um, our job was to write a psychobiography, which is essentially like a uh, a biography on a historical figure figure that could be still alive, but we do a psychoanalysis on them. And um, I asked my professor if I could do, do it on, on, on a sports figure. And, you know, Billie Jean King has been obviously such a role model for me in the tennis world, but also within the sports community. And I think I appreciated her when I was younger, but I didn't really fully appreciate everything she did until I got older, until I started having more conversations about pay quality and the differences between what women and men are doing in terms of pay disparity, um, rights, all, all this other stuff. And yeah, so I wrote a 15 page paper on her and um, pulled up a ton, pulled up a few books. I got her Pressure is a Privilege book. Okay. I read another one, Game Set Match on her by, I think it was written by Susan Ware. Um, I also pulled out several research articles that included her, but also I was also analyzing the time, the civil rights movement, all this other. So there was a whole thing of, I, I analyzed her, her um, childhood and life journey uh, with the backdrop of the historical context and the other things that were going on, as well as using different psycho, 
psycho psychological models to kind of like analyze all these things. But long story short, the thing that I realized was she was the perfect, she was, she was in the right place at the right time and in the right body and in the right soul. Um, just all those things aligned. And I, I, I will never forget that paper that I did. And I find it so ironic um, that I ended up for the first time in my tennis career life and also broadcasting life, I just so happened got, I was asked to not only cover world team tennis for the first time, which is something that she started back in the seventies after I did this paper, but I happened to not only cross paths, but interview her multiple times because we were doing this. Uh, I covered the U.S. Open, but it was for IBM, so it was internal, so not no, nobody could see it, and that's why it's it's not out there. But we worked together multiple times with this ESP or IBM project, and over that course, you know, I I got to know her, and I got to, and I eventually told her <laughs> I wrote the paper. Wow! I felt like I, I felt like I sounded like a a twelve year old, you know, like billy jean king i just wrote a paper on you and i got an a on it and all this other stuff but she was so funny and she's she's just she is as advertised and more like she's just she's just awesome i have no other words um but she's like we i said it in the middle of our show i was like billy jean i haven't said this to you but i wrote this 15 page paper on you it's like a psychoanalysis of your entire life journey and like so I know, you know, you mentioned your life purpose at 12 years old and you're going to fight for equality for the rest of your life and you're going to use tennis as a vehicle. So I knew everything about it. I was like using, putting this into the interview. And she's like, wait, bleh. you wrote this paper about, can you email this to me? She's like, I don't ever read anything about myself, but I want to read this. Wow. So she, <laughs> I was like, are you serious? I immediately, I was like, oh my God, I, I hope my paper was good. Like, what if I said something weird or inaccurate or offensive, you know, but, um, which is why I'm, I'm glad I'm, I'm in the field that I am because if I, if I ever wanted to, to do and actually publish a psychobiography, there are some huge, um, hurdles and steps and a huge process that you go through if you were to publish something like that. And that's to ensure that everything that you put in there is not only accurate, but also mm. ethical as well. But um, yeah, that was a cool moment. <laughs> when did she? So you sent it to her. Yeah. And then did she tell you what she thought of it? Has she, has she, she hasn't been able told to correspond me yet. with you? What did she say? No, I haven't heard from her. Oh, back you haven't heard from yet. her so, back yet. Yeah, so you will yeah. eventually. And I hope so. Yeah. Yeah. I'll have to let you know. Hopefully, yes. it's, it's all good things. <laughs> I, well, of course it is. Take us through what you did from interviewing her and all your other duties at this latest U.S. Open and being part of yeah. such a unique production because of the absence of fans, but the talent is there for the most part. Yeah, so this year was really different. I think what was very different about this year, so obviously, you know, in a broad, as a broadcaster, like people just, people will reach out so you can cover an event. Right. So uh, last year I worked for the USTA and also the US Open with our with their US Open Now show. And uh, this year was a little different. So a lot of the companies and sponsorships that were associated with the US Open, because nobody could go and be there, they asked me to help host some of their own corporate events. Mm -hmm. And so like Salesforce and IBM, who are huge partners with the US Open, everybody was trying to create these virtual experiences, not only for their, um, for their employees, but also their clients and corporate partners. So I ended up doing stuff with um, Salesforce and Andy Roddick and Sloan Stevens were a part of it. I also did stuff for IBM, which, you know, they're, they've been a partner with the US Open for 29 years. They do all of their, uh, they've got their Watson stuff. They do all their analytics and stats and also um, they're a huge part of their reconfiguration and plan for their website and their app as well. So they do everything. Yeah. And um, so with that, I worked with, they had Martina Hingis, Billie Jean King, Andy Roddick, Jimmy Connors. Yeah, so those four. So it was a really, it was a really fun, um, it was a really fun experience. We talked a little bit. So each day I would host four one hour shows. Some of it was talking about the tennis and a little update. A lot of it was really talking about um, some of the things IBM was doing. So it was weird. It was, it was like covering the US Open from like, but from a technological perspective. 
Um, but then I would also talk some tennis. We would also spend half of the hour um, talking with uh, Billy Jean King or Jimmy Connors about their favorite memories of the U.S. Open, dissecting their careers and their journeys and all that other stuff. So it was really unique. You think about, Prim, your own journey in sports casting, and with that, there comes the ego that is riddled in the industry, the competition being cutthroat. When was a moment when you ran across somebody in your career, a colleague or a peer, who did something to elevate your trajectory when it wasn't self-serving for that person? It was uncalled mm. for, but it was something that was beautiful and the exact opposite of ego. Yeah. Well, I, I don't know if it's like the, I don't think it was self-serving in any way. And, but I, the first person that comes to my mind is my mentor, Tom Suter. And uh, I was 22 years old, just trying to get into the business and recently graduated from college. And I got really lucky. He was like, probably the third or fourth person that I had really truly run into, into the industry. And okay. he, I reached out to him and he helped me get my first job at that station, WRAL in Raleigh, Durham. And, um, and he took me under his wing and he, um, he was just, he was just amazing. He, he became like one of my best friends and father figures. I still stay in touch with him today. Um, and he always said to me, Primster, he always called me Primster. Primster, Primster, be kind. I don't care what you do. I don't care what you do or who you become. Just be kind. And it was just so simple. And he would always say that. And it it really aligned with a lot of the things that my mom and dad had taught me as well. And so I, you know, at a very early age, I got a glimpse of what the industry could be like because, yeah, you know, there's a lot of there's a lot of wonderful people. There's also a lot of bitter people too. And I get it. I mean, the industry really wears you down. So sure. I'm probably one of those old bitter people as well. But I, I had always just remember that. And so very early, I said to myself, I was like, listen, I know I'm in a cutthroat business, but even if it's going to take me longer, I'm going to do it my way. I'm going to do it the right way, not being competitive and not being cutthroat, but treating people Kindly, because otherwise it's like, what's the whole purpose of doing this? So I can like look back at my legacy and be like, I didn't win every job and I didn't win every, maybe I didn't do well every single show, but at least I was nice. And I think the first time I really saw that come to fruition and see the fruits of my labor in terms of just like being nice to people was when I got laid off in Miami for my CBS job in Miami. So I made this pretty big jump from Raleigh, Durham, North Carolina, a cable station to the CBS station in Miami. Um, and it happened after the economy plummeted. And um, so that happened around 2008, the financial crisis. And it took a couple of years for all these companies to start taking a financial hit. So I got laid off in 2010. And that was like, oh my God, that was like a kick in the pants. I was not prepared for that. That was like, that was like one of the toughest moments I've ever had. I mean, it's just literally like getting broken up with and you have yeah. like no, no warning whatsoever. And it happened and after I had just covered my first Super Bowl in Miami. So um, right after that, though, there were so many people who reached out to me like, hey, the Dolphins are doing this stuff. Like, do you want to help them out? Or, hey, oh, wow. you know, um, WQAM radio, we're, you know, you want to fill in for Sid this weekend? Or how about, how about this? Or, hey, I have, I heard about this job over here. Um, and still, like, and some of those people that I worked with in Miami, I would say like 60% of them, I ended up working with at the national level at ESPN or some capacity. So I think that was when I got laid off, um, that first time I got laid off <laughs> at ESPN too, but just like both of those moments when you're, when you feel like you're down and out, like, and just getting a text or a call or people just you know, reaching out and trying to help and say like, hey, I just talked to this person. Why don't you give them a call? Because um, they might have something going on, you know? And those are the things like people don't have to do. Um, yeah, so I would say uh, those two instances were probably the Tom, Tom Suter and then uh, my Miami layoff. <laughs> wow, the, the kindness that people feel from you wants them to help you write in return and how 
that yeah. one mentor laid the foundation of that and it's it's been blooming and in, in so important to the core of who you are and how you've made so much success in your career my final question for you prim is, is being a mother now how has that changed your outlook on life oh, no words like you hear <laughs> people say that right i mean you're a father you're a father of a fur baby so you yeah, exactly. you understand a little different that than uh, than a human but uh, <laughs> yeah. but it, it is kind of like a starting kit though it gives you a glimpse into like having to take care of something and um yeah i don't really i don't know how to express that into words because you i re remember hearing it you know and i was never a girl that like dreamt of getting married or having kids so i always heard people say like oh your life changes you never look at anything the same again and you're like i've heard this so many times and then you get through it and you're like oh my god like you know what was i thinking before yeah. um you know i think it's just you gain a, a greater appreciation for life in such a simple, innocent way. We take so many things for granted, you know, just like little things like walking or going out to a restaurant for the first time or going out and seeing, you know, an airplane or a helicopter. Yeah. And those things are just so, or like just speaking, you know, or jumping or <laughs> like, taking great pleasure in making Mickey Mouse waffles at seven in the morning, yes. you know, and just taking like 30 minutes or taking 30 minutes to eat breakfast and just graze on a buffet of food, which is what my son happens to do. <laughs> like he'll have like rice and cheese and I'll force him to eat fruit with eggs and spinach, but then he'll want like a Mickey Mouse waffle. <laughs> it's just like, Aww. you know, I mean, it's literally like a Las Vegas buffet in front of him every single morning. Um, but yeah, I think it's, he's just, um, he's opened my eyes to the freshness of life and also, you know, just the, the things that we really take for granted, you know? And so he's able, like every, I would say every other day he says something and I'm like, you know, I'm like, I never looked at it from that way. Like, you know, <laughs> or I never thought of like doing, or that, that thing, you know, would be an activity or something fun to do. So. I think it's just about like re-engaging with life in a way that I had never imagined because I don't remember it as a baby or as a kid, like none of us do. And also like the feeling is though somebody not only just likes you and, and needs you, but they, they, they just love you. Like yeah. it, it would feel as though their life would fall apart yeah. because they need you that much. And it, it's not like in a, needy annoying way but like you know they'll come in like mommy or you know <laughs> or it's like when you come in and your dog is always happy to see you yes it's not like a human being that's just like <laughs> oh it's you again which is probably yeah. what I do my husband or vice versa you know <laughs> but you know at least for his age right now at two years old he'll come in and he's like mommy <laughs> and everything is just like fun and exciting so yeah, I think, I guess that's why people say your life changes because you're looking at life in a much different lens. One that we experience, but we don't remember, but we get to reimagine it and we get to re-experience it through the eyes of our kids. And I think that's why um, being a parent is so special. Prim Sripapat, serving this world with with so much beauty from being a mother to <laughs> dominating in sports media to what you're doing in the mental health field, just an absolute star in so many different ways. So grateful for you and thank you for thank you. Your, your want to, to help. You know, it's, oh, it's so, it, it's so special to have somebody that really does care and feels compelled to do this you know in a world and in media where there's so much selfishness you are the opposite you have so much selflessness oh, thank and you. so that's why the kindness that you you talked about radiates and why people want to help you you want to help others it's a great energy <laughs> and just hopefully when this whole life and pandemic and gets under control be hopefully run into you at a tennis event or or something yes. like that that would be just a, so much fun 
I know. Thank you so much for having me on. And also thank you for your sweet, kind, encouraging words. You know, I think that like the one thing that I desperately, I, I took for granted pre-pandemic is like that social interaction, you know, and just, uh, but you know, I, I enjoy things like this and reconnecting and meeting with people and all that stuff, but your words, um, you know, they give me, they give me fuel to keep moving through. So when I'm studying late at night and going through this 600 page manual <laughs> and I'm going nuts and I'm asking myself, like, what was I thinking? Like, can I actually do this? I'm going to remember your words and that will be the fuel that motivates me. There's a purpose to everything <laughs> you are doing. That is the key, the bottom line of this conversation. Prim Shripapat, I'm Brian Fenley. Prim, thank you so much. Thank you for having me on, Brian.